Hello and welcome to another episode of Pro Tip Conversations. Uh, today we're excited to welcome Sean Su uh, onto the podcast to you know chat about his venture as the co-founder of J17 Fitness and founder of the Movement Facilitation uh, Organization. Um, J17 Fitness is a performance and rehabilitation facility located in the Markham, Ontario area, where Sean focuses on utilizing principles of applied sports, applied sports science to inform training systems and programs for athletes of all levels. Uh, along with chatting uh, with Sean about his uh, ventures, we will discuss his journey in, into becoming a coach and a trainer and, you know, uh, how he got here. So welcome, Sean. Thanks. Excited to be here. Yeah. So th- jumping right into it, um, you know, first question we always ask is, you know, were you active, um, you know, in different sports and stuff growing up? Oh, for sure. I think I was a, I was a little bit of a brat. So I've always been super <laughs> active and it caused a lot of problems with my parents for sure. But I think that came with, um, with the excitement of playing sports and just, you know, running around and all that stuff. So yeah, so definitely growing up, it's, it's, I was a troublemaker. <laughs> yes. Did you, what were your uh, favorite sports that you played? So, uh, to start off, I think, uh, cause I lived in a lot of different countries growing up. Um, I grew up in the Middle East. So when I was there, the first sport I ever encountered was something called tetherball. I think it's uh, originated in South Africa or something, uh, but it was, it was really fun. So I think that's the first dose of competitiveness that I've kind of uh, tasted. And that really got me riled up and I really enjoyed the adrenaline rush and all that stuff. So, and then, you know, uh, moved to different countries, but tetherball was, was really the first sport that I've ever played. And then when I went back to Taiwan for a bit, I started playing all kinds of sport. I mean, um, you know, track and field, dodgeball, volleyball, uh, ping pong, badminton, just all kinds. I think um, it's, uh, I, I just enjoyed the adrenaline rush. Um, basketball was eventually my main sport, basketball and volleyball, but I didn't start basketball until I was about 10, 10 or 11. Okay. So, um, but that became my, my favorite and I stuck with it for until now. Awesome. And then, you know, as you played all these sports, at what point did you kind of feel that you were going to make a career out of, you know, this passion of athletics mm. and, you know, training and uh, I, man, for, I never thought that I was going to be able to be in the industry. It's, it's always been a goal of mine because I think just revolving around sports, I, I love the competitiveness in, in, in sports. And I think at, at the beginning, it started off as something cool that I wanted to do. I thought that, you know what, this is great. This is awesome. I can work with athletes and whatnot, but I think as, as you start to, I guess, age within the industry, within the career. And then as you grow up as well, you start to find different, I guess, motivations. And eventually it kind of nailed down towards uh, one thing for me is that I I just wanted to help optimize um, the body, the body for athletes and just make them a little bit more durable and maintain the ability to participate in the sport. Because growing up, that was the biggest challenges I think that I faced personally was injuries. And mm-hmm they suck and it really yeah. kind of sidelines you. And I think I'm sure you can relate to that too, Anish. And, yeah. and for me, I, I just wanted to be part of a piece of the pie to be able to help facilitate that ability to make sure that people can make informed decisions in terms of what they need to do and how they need to schedule their lifestyle, et cetera. And all, just all aspects of, of sports science to be able to maintain a durable body or stay resilient. So, um, so I think that really was what kind of drove me to number one, I guess, enter the sport head, Mm -hmm. head, heads on and, and maintain in the industry to, um, to just kind of help out because otherwise it's, if, if it's just sheer, like, Oh, it's cool. And it's, it's great working with these guys. It's, it's, I think most people won't be able to last because they, they, right. you'll realize really quick that, Oh, okay. Uh, what else is there to do other than just, you know, being able to work with athletes. Right. So yeah. I think there needs to be some sort of, 
um, deep drive and deep uh, coaches need to have some sort of value, uh, I guess, core values in terms of what can drive them to continue day in, day out, doing the same thing over and over again and keep researching or keep reading on things to, to, to stay, I guess, informed. So is, is that what drove you, I guess, you, you graduated from University of Toronto with a yeah. degree in health sciences. Did you already know that going into university that this is kind of the track that you wanted to go into? Or was that something you acquired during your time or maybe even after? Oh, for sure. Academics. Yeah. Definitely. It, it started off as, so uh, I was I was training, it started as, off as friends, right? So I was training mm -hmm. friends because I would say I, I was pretty lucky. I started training myself when I was about 16 years old. And, you know, okay. Anish, we're both in the 80s. We didn't have yeah. <laughs> the information that we have now. No. So it was really just kind of reading on books or seeing magazines of how people kind of lift weights and stuff. And you yeah. just kind of try to mimic that. So one of the things that I, looking back, I think what what I was lucky with was the fact that I had a gym in my condo where I was living back then. Okay. And specifically, that gym had a lot of mirrors. And mm -hmm. not many places had that. And I was always by myself when I was working out. And I was able to look at myself and provide that feedback. Obviously, this is always now looking back and start to understand the science aspect of it. But I was always kind of looking at myself, kind of seeing myself lift and making sure that my posture is right and whatnot. So I've, I think I've built this awareness in me. Mm. And then, um, and then I, 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 so needless to say, now moving into the university, I was able to help some of my friends because I think I have a little bit of a better awareness than some of my, my peers and my friends back in uni. So I always knew that this is something that I was good in, good at. But I never knew that I was going to dive full on into this stuff. Uh, it actually started off as wanting to be in a rehabilitation industry. And I, I did kind of go into it a little bit uh, in, in my career, which I'm very thankful for. Um, so, so being in health science, the, the generic, oh, Asian parents wanting you to go to like med school or <laughs> whatever cool. it is, right? So, so of course, that was, that was kind of one of the goals that I had in mind, but that fell short because I was never... I was never a, a, a smart kid. I was I was never really academically driven. Uh, I just wanted to kind of you know fly by and and just kind of pass and whatnot. But uh, but yeah, that was that was initially it started off as okay. I need to I need to go for med school. I need to do this because that is what my parents wanted. And then to realize that okay, I'm not cut out for this stuff. Um, right. And then I chose an alternative. And slowly, um, to answer your question, it's it's one of those things where I slowly grew into it. And I slowly made a realization that, okay, there's, uh, uh, you know, that there's, there's, there's a market in this, in this industry that I can probably do well in. And I just kind of continued on. Nice. And then I guess that leads us to J17 and uh, movement facilitation. Tell us a little bit about that. So movement facilitation started off uh, really back in 2014, probably. So it, um, it started off as, as something very a, a simple, I guess, simple venture, a simple goal of trying to bring some knowledge uh, back to Asia. So because I had a conversation with one of my elementary friends in, from Taiwan, and he said, he said that he had a talk with me because he was in the fitness industry. He still is in the fitness industry right now. And he said, he, we, had a, we had a quick talk and he thought that there's a market, I can bring some of the knowledge back to Asia because again, the information was not as available back then and still is now it's um, being able to translate some of the English literature into Chinese is mm -hmm. a bit of a tricky situation. And there's not a lot of research done in Asia to begin with, right? So most of the, I guess, the recent knowledge that we know of in the fitness industry or sports science world is really we get the we get all the the recent information. So anyway, it started off as just simply bringing knowledge back into Asia. So we started off as doing some some simple information sharing sessions in Asia, and to my surprise, it, it just blew up. So nice. people wanted more. So I decided to make it more of a system, and it, it's it's more of a conceptual system. Obviously, just kind of. Uh, synthesizing information that I know and tagging along with some of the experiences that I have and bring it back into Asia. 
So movement facilitation really started off as being able to share knowledge, uh, being able to get the practitioners and the coaches uh, knowledge up. And hopefully that can bring a little bit more informed training to the public and athletes as well. So really that was the, the, that was the main goal. And then it went on really, really well until 2020. 2020 was actually the biggest year that I was about to have for the company because I had a ton of places lined up. Um, I had Malaysia, I had Singapore, I had Taiwan, I had China, and I even had uh, Kenya as well. So, so that entire summer was, was just travel plans, right? Yeah, I wonder and, what happened that year, huh? Oh, <laughs> go figure, right? The world came to a standstill. <laughs> exactly. So, so, of course, like anything else, uh, everyone else, I guess, tried to explore the virtual option. Yeah. But it, it was very different because my courses was very practical. There was a mm-hmm. lot of practical components to it. So it wasn't the same. And I tried it for, for a few classes and it didn't feel the same. So I t- decided to just put that on hold. Uh, but the idea is still the same in terms of I really wanted to help people understand how to facilitate their movement better and be able to, again, prevent injuries or mitigate injuries and whatnot. And now it, it, my focus turned towards, all right, I need something a little bit more local. I need to I want to build something locally to be able to help the athletes. Number one, stay in Canada, because a lot of the athletes are going to, for example, the States, because obviously mm-hmm. that's where most of the most of the science is and uh, to be honest all the best facilities are in the states right but i feel like there's an industry or a market here in canada because we don't have enough of those people uh we do we do have a a few that are that are very very um i guess knowledgeable and successful in that field Mm -hmm. but not enough not nearly the same as in the states so i thought that okay let me try to do something about that and so that's where j17 uh, came to came to life and uh, we had, I have two business partners, two other business partners that share the same goal and share the same mission. So we're trying to, so that's, that's how J17 was created. So right now it's, it's, uh, we're in really year one, um, of doing J17 and I'm, I'm ready to, since it's, the world is opening up slowly. Yeah. So we're, I'm, I'm going to probably explore the option of traveling again and bringing some right. of these, these knowledge uh, which is which I'm thankful for because these these past two years during the pandemic, it really I was able to compile a lot of good data and a lot of good experiences that I think really helped out with the seminars and, and the courses. And I'm hoping to kind of share that to um, to back in Asia and 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 Kenya as well. So for your movement facilitation, I think as you were saying, it's more practical. In terms of, did you continue to run the virtual sessions at all, or did you just sort of stop those because they weren't having the same meaningful impact that you wanted? Um, exactly. Exactly. So it, it, it um, I put a halt to that. Okay. Now there are, I have a lot of friends from Hong Kong, for example, and Taiwan that would uh, regularly ask me to do kind of like a small little virtual session just to kind of inform what I know to their therapists or their coaches, mm-hmm. for example. So I, I wouldn't call it like, a, like my, my usual seminar sessions, it. but it would just Got be a, a, you know, a quick, all right, so Sean's going to come in and do a, a quick talk about this topic and Got are it. you guys available kind of deal. But, um, but yeah, so that, that officially that has been put on a halt, but I'm looking to get that back this year. Got it. I guess in, in this journey that you've been on, who have been your biggest coaching influences? Oh teachers, man, if you will. So back to the conversation of not being academically strong. I was always right. been one of those guys that's like in the back and just either falling asleep or just doing something else. Right. So <laughs> I've, um, and looking back, I, I wish I was a little bit more, had a little bit more grit in that sense. Just, just being able to be a little bit more responsible <laughs> yeah. because, uh, with that, I guess, shyness or just uh, lackadaisical lacked, kind of nature of me uh, being an academic student, I think uh, that took a hit in terms of finding mentors. So what, what happened uh, is right now I have, I have a couple of guys that I regularly talk to, and both of them are business owners. They're also in the industry. One is in the rehabilitation world. The other one is in the sports science world. And I look up to them very, very much. And they, they've helped me 
in terms of more on the really more on the business side and, business, and yeah. psychologically just kind of keep me um keep me afloat i guess in that sense but academically there there's there are mentors and there are people that i really look up to um but these are obviously they they don't know me um it, right. these are all like researchers sure. uh, I, I look to their research articles a lot um, because yeah. i believe in their theory and what they what they um i guess what they promote i shouldn't say what they promote what they're studying Right. So these are guys such as uh, Keith Barr, uh, Thomas Dos Santos is a guy that I really, uh, every time he has an article out, I, I try to kind of read it because he's, yeah. he's huge on change of direction ability and whatnot. Um, even Andy Galpin, he's, he's huge on just muscle, uh, understanding muscle architecture. And so there, there, there are a lot of different guys that I, I look up to and I, I, I would call them my mentor. Uh, like indirect yeah. mentor, I would say, sure, um, because their knowledge really kind of helped me flourish what I understand in the human body and movement. Yeah, I mean that's totally fine, right? I mean you don't have to necessarily meet your coaches and mentors if you're if you're able to absorb the knowledge that they're sharing and use it in your own life. That that serves a purpose. So I think uh, that's mm -hmm. awesome that you're able to find these folks that even though you've never spoken to them, you're able to absorb so much information from them. So, oh yeah, big time. Cool. Um, what, what's the best advice that you've heard from them, uh, or any of your, you know, uh, mm. past coaches, whether that's in, whether that's when you were playing competitive sports or. Yeah. Uh, man, I think I, I, I don't remember where I got this from, no. but right now, one of the things I, I follow deeply is just enjoy the, enjoy the journey, right? So have a goal. But don't set that as your, I guess, like have a goal in mind, but you always have to remember it's that it's always the journey that counts, right? And I think that's that's one of the things I really, I really kind of value, right? So, and, and, and really, I carry my life around with that, with that quote, it's just enjoy the journey because, um, because if you have a dive head down into just kind of looking at the goal, you're going to miss out a lot. And it's really the journey that counts because that's where you learn. That's where you fail. And you really kind of learn from failures and your mistakes. And that's the only thing that's going to make you stronger. Right? And throughout the journey, you're going to find yourself being a different person than you, you started off. And eventually when you start, when you hit the goal, that's going to mean also a lot differently than when mm -hmm. you set out the goal to be right. So I think, um, uh, just constantly being able to self-reflect and whatnot, uh, that's, that really kind of means a lot to me. And I try to bring that to my athletes as well. And when I teach, it's also something that I say to most of the guys uh, that attend my courses, that really is the journey that matters. And throughout this, throughout this journey, you're going to find you, yourself changing uh, certain, I guess, belief systems that you may have. And I certainly have changed a lot of my belief systems in the coaching, whether it's it's coaching philosophies or or, or the certain sciences that I thought was down packed and I thought it's a for sure thing, but, but yeah, there, uh, just be ready to, to do constant self-reflection and, and change, change your, um, your belief system. That's awesome. And, and enjoy I guess the to the, sorry. I, oh, no, I and enjoy point. the joining. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that makes a ton of sense. Um, to, to that point, I guess, what do you think makes a great coach? Uh, I think there's a lot, but I think if I want to really nail it down to one thing, and this is it, it usually doesn't have what to be I, one. You can go into many. If you oh want. man. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start. How about this? I'll start with this. Okay. So, okay. and this is this is what I I try to look for when I do interviews and stuff like that. Is um, does a coach fully grasp the the notion of Dunning Kruger effect? Because to me. Uh, what Dunning Kruger effect is basically your perceived knowledge versus your absolute knowledge, right? So, basically, how that portrays uh, in terms of characteristic as a human being or a coach is whether or not you're humble. You're humble enough to know what you know and know what you don't know, kind of deal, right? So, I find a lot of coaches they they have they the the good way to put it is they have too much confidence. The bad way to put it is that they have too much ego. And those are the things that it, 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 to me, it's an absolute no, no. If you have too much right. ego and not enough humaneness, that is a 
bad combination right <laughs> because we're a lot of times for example we're uh we're working with olympians we're working with professional athletes especially olympians they have four years to prepare for one event right and as we all know olympians they don't earn a lot of money especially right. in canada they don't they don't they don't have funding so right. they're really sacrificing a lot they're sacrificing their social uh relationships their their relationships to begin with they're sacrificing their hobbies just for this one goal four years in four years if you let your ego get in the way of a proper training or program or or set or helping them out that's that's a huge mistake that you make as a coach and right. they don't have time that you you can't just trial and error things um well obviously you try and error all the time but you have to make the best informed decision that you can and you have to get your ego out of the way so for me that's something that i think makes a good coach um is that if you can comfortably tell me that uh what you know and you know exactly what you don't know obviously this will come through time but as long as you have an idea of that's the way that you should approach the industry then i i think you're a good coach and it doesn't matter how smart you are or how much you know to be honest as long as you know that okay there's still a lot that i need to learn and every time i make a decision i need to make sure that whether or not i grasp the con the fully the concept of this uh for example phenomenon or whatever right so i'm just getting to the rabbit hole of these concepts and and um as long as they can do that they're a good coach yeah i guess like knowledge can be acquired but you can only acquire knowledge if you know that you need to go and acquire knowledge right exactly. so if you think you already know everything then then you're not going to learn anything exactly yeah. exactly yeah. and i i and and some i fully believe that because some people ask me like how how do you differentiate between an expert and someone who's not and i usually say an expert usually start with they or whenever they describe a phenomenon they will they will use certain phrases and these phrases generally can be for example quote unquote um in my opinion mm -hmm. i believe i'm not too sure stuff stuff like that uh, or give me a little bit more context so if they can put these phrases uh in while they're trying to describe something i think these people are true experts because they understand again the dunning kruger effect because they need a little bit more context to 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 really ex describe um the whatever question it is right so so i think um so yeah so it's it's these are in my opinion what makes a good coach awesome um and then on the flip side with all the clients that you're working with what makes a good client or or student mm, um a good student would be someone who has fortitude. So I have a lot of kids who uh, I think, so uh, a better, uh, uh, I think the layman term would be grit. So in my opinion, I think, uh, so I, I've gone, right now the process that I personally like to go through when, uh, when I get athletes is I like to go through an interview. And the reason for this interview is I want to make sure that I'm not wasting their time, mm -hmm. their parents' money, and my time. Uh, because I, I've seen too many kids start off as very gung-ho and they have this, this passion in them to know that it fell short after two weeks, right? So I think a lot of kids, they've, they, they want to get somewhere, but they don't know what it takes to get there. And this is, I guess that we can kind of relate this back to, are they, are they willing to enjoy the journey? Are they willing to kind of go through the journey instead of looking at this long-term goal, which can be two, three, four years down the road, right? Because a lot of kids, uh, they, uh, like I said, I will ask them, okay, are you competitive? Competitiveness to me, I thought was a good measure in terms of making a good student, but it, it actually may not be because they could be very competitive in their sport. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down, because, and the reason why they're competitive and they want to, they want to constantly play the sport is because they enjoy it. It brings mm -hmm. them enjoyment and they've never really kind of faced challenges. The thing about strength and conditioning is we're constantly putting these kids in a quote unquote painful situation, meaning that in order to get strong, you have to explore weaknesses. 
and I have to, they have to face those weaknesses and they, I put them in those positions because they need to get strong in those positions. For example, they absolutely hate it. Right. But do you have the fortitude? Because fortitude basically means that you're able to handle these, these painful situations or painful scenarios and they, they keep grinding and they, they kind of eventually kind of step out of it. Right. So I think uh, fortitude is something that I think can bring uh, what makes a good student. And these are honestly the student that, um, that have been carrying, I guess, continuing on with me all these years is uh, because they, they relish the challenges. They, yeah. they invite them and they really want to, they want to have those challenges in them so that they can face it. Number one, they can overcome it. And they can learn from it. So these are the students that I find are the best students and they can be successful in life uh, no matter where, where they go. And a lot of times I, uh, I, I, I try to make sure that they understand that sports just is just a way to learn about different life skills. Right. And if you can understand that and you can grasp that concept, then even if you don't get into a major league or whatever it is that you want to go for, Again, you, you learn a lot and you can be probably successful in life because if you have fortitude, you know, yeah, you know, business is all about fortitude, right? Like yeah. life is all about like having challenges and you can face them. You can, you can, you can overcome them and you can learn from your mistakes. Yeah. Now, what else someone, is there? Yeah. Someone, right. someone said you build this, even if you don't achieve your goals, pursuing them, you build the strength of character, right? Uh, as you're going for that. Do you find that the ones that are successful, they have, let's say, you know, take athletes that are playing basketball, for example, mm -hmm. but then you make them do a bunch of um, exercises and drills that, you know, seemingly from your knowledge and your information, you know that that's, this will benefit their performance. Mm -hmm. But it's, do they need, if they don't have the foundational belief that this will long-term benefit their performance, do you see them tapering off? Um, or have you found like they need to have that switch click in their minds that this is, you know, even though I'm not dribbling a ball right now, mm -hmm. what I'm, the squats I'm doing are going to help me in, in my game later. For sure. I think, uh, it's, a uh, part of it is education. I think part mm -hmm. of it is educating them, letting them understand why they're doing this and understand that them doing this right now even though they won't be able to do something that they find enjoyment in, but it will benefit them down the road. So I do find that people who fail to understand that they will probably do well in the short term, but eventually mm -hmm. they start to break down. Right. And I think adolescents are, are it kind of, it's, it's very, you, you see the trend. For, for me, a lot of adolescents, one of the things that they go through that adults don't go through is growth spurts, right? right? And usually that's where people call, that's what people call growing pains and stuff like that. And yeah, for me, yeah. I've seen way too many injuries in kids where yeah. they just continue to play, play, play without really strengthening their bodies. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I honestly, not, I'm not sure if it's, if it's due to um, social norms that have changed over the years. Obviously, right now we all have phones and TVs and stuff like that. Whereas in the past, we don't really have that. So kids are more out, out and about kind of doing mm -hmm. multiple different things. And that in itself is a form of strengthening your, whether it's cardiovascular system or, or whatever it is. Right. So I'm not sure how much that, uh, of that is attributed to that, the social norm uh, changes in the social norm, or is it, uh, due to, um, I don't know, the food or whatever that we're eating. So I have no idea, but the, the thing is there's, Injuries in adolescence has, has taken a rise and especially okay. after COVID, right? So right. I, I see that a lot. And I mean, we can, we can make a lot of inferences on why that happened after COVID because obviously everyone's sedentary, everyone right. went virtual, kids right. are doing virtual schooling and they're just sitting there instead of doing something silly. Right. So, so yeah, so I think um, a lot of it is just educating them under letting them understand, Hey, listen, the reason why you're in this position is because potentially you have gone through this year of not doing anything, for example, right? And maybe it, you should consider now just slowly getting back into mm. this or uh, by doing these exercises. And then right. you can start getting back into sports uh, at 50% right. capacity, 60%. There's a way that you can go about this progressively in order to get to where you want to be. 
So mm-hmm. I think letting them understand that there is there is there are milestones to hit. I think because uh, a lot of times having a long term goal sometimes for kids it's hard to grasp, right? So right, right. for me, it's all about hitting milestones or short term goals. Create short term goals for these kids, saying that listen, we don't need to go long term. By in two weeks' time, this is what I want to see from you. You able to do fifteen squats or uh, instead of ten without pain or without without feeling that it's, it's super exerting in your system. And when mm-hmm. you feel that, okay, you've hit that milestone. Next step. This is what we're going to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think kids enjoy that. Um, letting that, uh, yeah. So, so, but like awesome. if they fail to do that, yeah, there, there are definitely consequences that I see personally in, in, um, in my career. Okay. And just, I guess, out of curios- curiosity, what are the age groups that you end up coaching typically? You mentioned kids and, mm-hmm. and, and Olympians as well. Like, what's the age range for your clients? I don't take, I, I generally don't take kids that are under 10. Okay. The main reason it's not, it's not because they're not, it's not suitable for them. It's more, they're hard to control. And it's, um, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, very, I know I have two kids. <laughs> it, it, there you go. <laughs> so uh, the only odd case that I do is if they're, let's say eight, eight years old and they want to, they want to get trained. I say, if you want to get trained, you got to go private. Because I, I can't control four, four eight-year-olds right. um, in a session. So most of the adolescents that uh, we do in the facility are groups. So okay. we, we do break it down. So we have 11 to 13, 14 to 16, and then 17 and above kind of deal. Mm-hmm. So we, we try to break it down. Uh, a few reasons is because generally speaking, generally speaking, not all cases are like this, but generally speaking, the younger you are, the less training age that you have meaning that you've probably you're very very novice in training right so in those cases we approach training very differently um right. in the beginning it's just about building strength and right. in a very simplistic term that's that's what it is just building strength and making sure that their technique is right uh, because body awareness for kids they're still exploring at the age of 11 to 13 they're still not right. sure of where their joints are and stuff like that so right, right. Um, so that's kind of our focus. And if it's like 14 to 16, they have a little bit of an idea of their body. So we can challenge them a little bit more. And uh, 17 and above, obviously, most kids, they have gone through some sort of training. So they're, they're a little bit more intermediate in that sense. Uh, not all cases, but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's how we kind of break it down. But we do work with age groups from 11 and up, uh, I should say eight and up. Um, and, and Olympians it, it, at that stage, it's just about making sure that we individualize the training and making sure that these, these, uh, these training are suitable for the, for the age group that we work with. Okay. And do you do folks that are uh, a lot older as well? Uh, for sure. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that I, I, I guess I, I focus on is, is optimizing. So optimization is a long-term goal, right? So being able to optimize fitness or health is something that's relevant for a kid, but also very, very relevant for adults that are of any age groups. So obviously the approach becomes very, very different because training a 30 year old is very, very different than training a 12 year old, right? So um, for starters, 30 year olds, they have a lot of injuries that's kind of logged into their system. So you have to take those into account. The recovery rate is very different as well. And the needs are very different. So for example, um, a 49 year old adult who wants to just optimize uh, this, I'm just giving a, a live example of one of my clients, mm-hmm. a 49 year old who wants to be able to optimize their health. And the reason why they want to do that is to be able to be functional and they want to be able to, in a micro scale, be able to go to wherever their kids go to. For example, if their kid wants to climb up, climb up that hill, they want to be able to instantly say, yes, let's do that. And then follow his kid. And in a macro level, if a kid wants to travel to wherever they want to go, I have the energy and the capability to travel on a plane as well right. without feeling the consequences of edema or like swelling in the legs and stuff like right. that. Right. So, right. so it, it's, um, so yeah, so like optimizing health and fitness to me is is really valuable for these 
these clients that are slightly um, older or, or just like 30 and above. Uh, and I think that comes down to the reason uh, I, I just like to see people healthy. I like yeah. to see people being able to do what they want to do without worrying about, oh, I'm going to feel these consequences and whatnot. <laughs> it's just silly to me. And I think, um, and that's why I'm, I'm so passionate about telling people to go exercise. And uh, a lot of times people think that it needs to be sophisticated. They need to have this, oh, special program. When in honesty, it really need, doesn't need to be. Like a lot of times I, I tell guys, especially my friends, because we're all like in our 30s and almost approaching 40 yeah. year old, right? So a lot of my friends right now, they're in that stage where they're feeling aches and pains. And some of the things that I hear are crazy. They say, well, if I work out, I'm going to be in a lot of pain or I'm going to be injured. I'm like, yeah, you're going to be injured or pay in pain regardless. <laughs> so yeah. do you want to be in, like, do you want to be strong and in pain or do you want to be weak and in the pain? Right. So I'm like, right. you pick, right. If, I would pick strong and in pain. Right. So, so I tell them it, it doesn't need, need to be sophisticated. Just go to the gym. Just, mm -hmm. just go onto the bike do your do your cardio you know that's we call it zone two training just to kind of get your aerobic nature up or just hit weights it doesn't need to be crazy just just pound the weights like you don't need as long as you don't go nuts and you progressively go into it right. um then you're 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 good you, you're already in an 80 percent uh better you're already 80 percent better than most the general population at your age right, right? so right. It, it really is as simple as that to be honest awesome um, got a couple more questions and then we'll jump into the rapid fire. Okay. Um, so I guess, tell us something that you have learned that people might not know about being a performance coach. It's not as easy as you think <laughs> it's number one, the fitness industry, there's still a lot of unknown. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of people just, for example, if we're just talking about how to get big, hypertrophy that's what we call it people think that they have they have a science down uh, and they, they have a protocol that you can do because most people especially in the bodybuilding world, world they'll say oh yeah just ramp up your reps and just kind of go to fatigue uh, get that mechanical stress in your body when in actuality science the the sports science or sports medicine world they have no idea how how, how mechanistically how this works they don't know so there's a lot of unknowns in the fitness industry, and um, you need to diligently uh, be, be diligent about learning. You have to keep upgrading your your knowledge, and especially in the muscle muscle world, for example, it's it's frustrating because one one week you'll be like, "Oh, okay, this paper came out. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> this is how this happens." And then the next week, all of a sudden, there's a counter paper that shows completely right. the opposite. And you're like, oh, great. What everything I thought was true, now it's out the window. Right. Uh, that's why like, it's, it's so difficult. And if you, if you go into the rehab world as well, the one thing that people will tell you is that they have no idea what the parameters are. Like, again, you go to a physio, for example, they'll tell you, oh, you do uh, three sets of 12 of this exercise. How did they come up to this conclusion? Frankly, it's a lot of it is just by experience. Mm. They just have an experience th knowing that, okay, when you do this set and this rep, you won't get injured because it's the mm. safest range that you can do. And that's why it's been given. It's almost like a, a, like a, um, a daily recommended dose for right. supplements. It's like the safest dose that you can take to not screw up your body, right? So, but that is different than true adaptation or true optimization right so there's still so much unknown in the industry so number one that's be ready for that number two it's a lot harder than you think in the sense that your schedule is going to be a mess because you have to work with available times of the clients clients yeah. right what does that mean if you are working with general population unfortunately you're going to have to be available after five or six o'clock right you have to work on times when people are off work you have to work on weekends when people are out enjoying their, their family time, their vacation and whatnot. When people have vacation, you got to stay. You got to be available right. for those clients. That means sometimes waking up at five o'clock or four o'clock in the morning and do this almost every single day. If you have the same client, right? That that's, or, you know, who just wants to commit, right? 
um, one of the worst things that can happen as a coach is that you look at your own comfort in terms of schedule and you prioritize that. And if you right. do that, you're not going to get far as a coach, right? So, so understanding that scheduling is, is, is really tough. You're going to have to sleep early or sometimes sleep late, wake up early, right? And just be willing to do that. And um, it can seem like a novelty, like a novelty in the beginning, but try doing that year in, year out, one year, two years, three years, 10 years, right? So are you able to keep up with that? So I think that's the, that's the marathon that people don't understand they have to go through yeah. um, when it comes to the fitness industry. It's just working and, with odd times. And I imagine that's not just a sacrifice that you have to make, but your family has to make that as well, right? Because when the, when kids are off school, you might be working and like after school, you might not be there because that's when your clients are available. So yeah, it's exactly. just, that's such a key insight of, you know, the difficult uh, nature of the job. So you really should. I imagine you have to really love what you do in order to keep pushing, pushing that. Otherwise it's not worth it. Right? Exactly. So, and, yeah. and you, you mentioned a really good point Nish, is, is the, the, the dynamics, right? The dynamics of your own social life and your family right. life, right? These are, these are the small, these are the nuances that people don't think about. Like, right. you know, from communicating with your partner, with your kids, letting them understand that this is just your career. This is your job. Yeah. This is what you have to go through, but making, um, Time management, I guess, like time yeah. management is so key in this industry. Yeah. Like, and I think goes with most of the self-employed um, businesses or, or even businesses in general. Right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so treat it as a business because that's what you're basically are. You are, you are self-employed and you're going to have to get used to that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a great insight. Um, last one before the rapid fire, mm -hmm. tell us about a challenging experience you had as a coach and what you learned from that. Man, there's there are too many. Um, <laughs> I think uh, w one of the biggest thing that happened early on in my career is that when I was training, uh, my client. So, for example, this this is this this happened. This actually happens more often than you think in the fitness industry. Is that you you did something that overloaded the client and they got injured, right? So this is something that is a huge no-no right now in my books because my my philosophy is do no harm. So right. you'd rather be undertrained than overtrained. Yeah. So that's that's always my philosophy. Like you don't want to do like you see a lot of these things on social media right now where they go crazy with either the reps or the the the, the sets or they they just do something completely complex in the in the uh, for the movement system that they can't just, just do, they can't do it. But you see a lot of coaches uh, do that in, in, in the facilities or, or just on Instagram. Right. And I, I personally, when I, when I went through that in the beginning, it was really a big rude awakening because number one, I had, there's a, there's a couple ways of going about this. Number one, I can easily blame it on something else. I could easily say, mm -hmm. Oh, you didn't sleep well. You didn't eat well or whatever, or, uh, you didn't land. So I can put the blame on someone on the client themselves or any other variables because injury, injury risk, there's, it's so multifactorial that you can offload to other reasons, but right. Do you have the guts to be able to own the, your own mistakes? Right. right. So, I learned that the quick way. Um, so I learned that you, in order to grow and in order to, I guess, become, become the coach that you want to be, you need to own up to your mistakes. And for me, that was a really hard thing to do because obviously who wants to take the blame for, yeah. for something that they did wrongly. Right. So, but, um, but yeah, so that was, those were, that was probably one of the, one of my worst um, feeling uh, in the industry is that injuring a client that I, that was under my watch, that was, um, that was definitely not a good feeling, but I had to learn right. quick. Number one, own up to your mistakes, because when you own up to your mistakes, you put the responsibility on yourself and you make sure that you do your diligent reading and, um, and, and try to just get better at not, um, not putting clients in, an, in a risky situation to get injured. So that comes with making sure that you, you, uh, you go through 
a questionnaire, if you will, right? So um, making sure that they're well recovered, what have they been doing the past two, three days? Are they ready to accept these loads? Um, if they're not, do you have a plan B for them and whatnot? Right. Or are you ready to let them just go home and just rest? Right. right. So, so these are, these are things that I think I've, I've learned through mistakes and, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to still, you know, uh, be, be good at doing this because it's, it's hard. It's, it's not yeah. a, it's, there's no protocol out there. No science. Every that person's tells you. different, right? Every, Every person's different. There's no cookie cutters. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, so that, those were small little things that I think, um, that, um, that I think that can help a coach grow. Um, but those are that's that's one of the the worst experiences that I've I've had is that injuring yeah. injuring clients. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure if if you're owning up to it, I would hope that the client sees that as a way of building trust as well, right? Like for sure, that you're not just going to offload the responsibility on them and then wash your hands clean of it, right? It, it it's uh yeah, I think it's key as any coach trainee relationship in other sports as well that. You know, it's a partnership and sometimes exactly. you make mistakes, sometimes the other person makes a mistake and you got to be able to own your mistake and move forward. So, yeah. And I, I think that awesome. that comes along with like being able to um, be humble. Right. So and that's that's yeah. uh, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about in terms of what makes a good coach. Right. Yeah. Is that like if you kind of throw it out there in the very beginning, letting them know that, OK, you're not a know it all kind of guy. Right. All right, that makes sense. That these are these are trial and errors that you are constantly trying to go through, and you're trying to. Right. But as long as they know that, okay, you're also human. You're you're trying to your best to be able to to help me out. You know, that's yeah. those are those are the rapport building strategies and 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 necessities that you have to you have to go through to build trust, right? So makes sense. Yeah. All right, that was awesome. All right, jumping into the rapid fire now. All right, here we go. Yeah. Uh, Take, if you if you need a couple of seconds, take your time. You don't have to rush too fast. <laughs> yes. Um, what what is your pro tip for someone looking to raise their fitness level? Just start. Just Again, start. start. Get your get your butt in the gym and <laughs> progressively overload. All right. So don't go all all out and <laughs> guns blazing at the start. Just like start slow and um, but just you can start with five minutes, ten minutes, but just get it done. Got it. Favorite athlete? It has to be MJ. I grew up watching MJ. He's he's my GOAT. Uh, I think I learned a lot in terms of competitiveness and all that stuff from him. So he's my favorite athlete. Nice. Favorite sneaker? I don't really have one. I'm okay. one of those guys that if it looks nice, I'll get it. But okay. I will say I have a – it's more of a sentimental thing. Scotty Pippen ones. Those are the sneakers that I started wearing when I first played basketball. So I have a special relationship with Scotty Pippen ones. I love it. And it started my basketball journey. Nice. Uh, favorite workout song? So it may come to a surprise. I actually don't listen to music when I work out. I see it as a cheat code. Um, oh, this okay. obviously goes, it's different for every, every person, but I figure if, I'm going through a difficult workout and I don't have a music that's pumping in my ear that, that motivates me. I need to build my own mental resilience to be able to get that done. So when it comes down to, oh, now I'm playing a game and it's pumping my favorite music, it's almost like I'm on steroids. Okay. Fair enough. Any go-to healthy snacks? Uh, I love berries. Any sort of berries I enjoy because they're full of antioxidants. But there are times to time when I'm, uh, I need protein and stuff like that. So my go-to protein bar is the Combat Protein Bar. Um, okay. They taste the best. Awesome. Uh, any favorite gym equipment? This one was tough. This is tough. Uh, I would say the bar because it's so dynamic. You can do a lot of different okay. stuff with the bar. So I have to go with the bar. Just a simple Olympic bar? Just, just the bar. Yeah. Just the yeah. bar itself. All right. And any favorite exercise? Definitely the rare foot elevated split squats or people call it like a lunge, lunge or okay. lunge squat. Um, that's my favorite exercise because you can hit so many different muscle groups. Um, and it's the best, best bang for your buck in terms of if you want to pick an exercise, get that done. And then the least favorite. Love and hate relationship, Anish. It's also the <laughs> rare foot elevated split squats because they can 
be Big so <laughs> painful. Um, so it's it's a love and hate relationship right there. Fair enough. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for your time. Um, at the end of this video, or in the description of this video, I'll include all the links to your sites and your Instagram so people can follow you. Awesome. Uh, I know you have some uh, courses that you're putting out soon. Um, do Correct. you want to tell anyone, uh, people about that a little bit? Yeah. So it's, um, again, most of my seminars are helping people understand how to facilitate movement properly. So I have uh, some upcoming courses that have been accredited by the NSCA. Um, so these are these are courses that talks about how to improve mobility, for example, or how to maximize your strength. So yeah, if, if you're interested, it's, um, it's, it's something that I'm ready to do uh, in person. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready to start launching these courses again, starting um, uh, spring, springtime. So, nice. um, so yeah, so stay tuned. Yeah, keep a lookout for that. Yeah, <laughs> stay tuned and hopefully that can, that can help people out. All right. And uh, to all the listeners, please like and subscribe to the Pro Tip channel. And on Instagram, it's Pro Tip underscore app. Um, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me.